Welcome everybody. What this video is going to be is going to be an overview, basically a voiceover of the clinic I provided at the Allegheny Western Division 12 mini-meet in Erie, Pennsylvania uh, back in September of 2019. Uh, I gave this presentation on power transformer basics for model railroaders and the reason behind it is I've seen a lot of transformer models, a lot of loads on cars, uh, even in substations, and they're really not prototypically correct, especially when you get into the era that a lot of us tend to model, the transition era, you know, late 50s or 50s into the early 60s and whatnot. Uh, the transformers that were in place, the manufacturers that were in place back then, a lot different than nowadays. So I figured uh, to help my fellow model editors, and since I was interested in it myself, as I work on this for my layout and the research that I'm doing is certainly helping me learn as well was to present a actually this is going to probably going to be a series of clinics that I provide over the years and at the end you'll see kind of my proposed my proposed excuse me thank you very much for that interruption <laughs> for the my proposed uh, series of clinics that I'm working on uh, a little bit of background on myself you know why should you even listen to me and that's a very good question uh, I've been in the transformer business for most of my career, uh, about 25 years or so now. I started out as a uh, medium core form design engineer for Westinghouse in uh, Green Tree, Pennsylvania, where I worked with a bunch of the ex-Westinghouse Sharon design engineers. They trained me. Uh, they had just moved down. The Sharon plant had recently closed. All the operations had moved out to either Muncie or St. Louis. Uh, they had also, Westinghouse at that time, in 1987, had just purchased the GE large transformer operation out of Pittsfield, Massachusetts. So several GE engineers were also on board. I uh, was there for three years, being the medium core form designer. And then, at the time, long story short, but the ABB had, had then purchased uh, that particular Westinghouse business, and they wanted to move all their engineers either to Muncie or to St. Louis. Well, I had family ties back in eastern Pennsylvania, a military obligation with the Pennsylvania Air National Guard. So basically, okay, hopefully that goes away for good now. <laughs> so basically, I didn't want to move out, out to the west or midwest. I got a job with GE at our Philadelphia service facility where we re did repair work, and I was a transformer repair specialist. I was there 10 years, repaired all types of transformers, we basically brought them in, tore them down, uh, rewound coils, made tank modifications, uh, integrated new load tap changes, did all kinds of cool work on transformers. Well, at the end of that stint, I did have a little bit of a break and went to work for GE Transportation up in Erie, Pennsylvania, for a couple of reasons. And basically, they wanted me to move to Atlanta, and I wasn't really hip to that jive. So I said, nah, I wanted to stay with GE. Uh, enjoyed the, the, the company and again had my military obligation family members in uh, the eastern part of Pennsylvania so I went up to Erie worked for GE transportation for a while then came back to the transformer business and been there ever since uh, and now I work in a more strategic role with all of the various uh, repair facilities across the United States so with that behind me again I will caveat it I'm no expert uh, I've been in the business I've seen what I've seen and can talk about that. Certainly don't know everything about all transformers, all manufacturers, all types. Uh, I'm not a power systems guy, so I don't have a, you know, a lot of background in the actual use of these uh, pretty cool devices in the systems themselves. That's where the power engineers, power system guys come in. And basically, I'm, I'm, I was involved in the inside of them, you know, tearing them down, ripping them apart, and fixing them again. So, all right, so what this is, it is a pro-sub guide to the construction types and manufacturers and the major components of large power transformers. Now, my focus is in the mid to late 1950s, the Westinghouse facility in Sharon, Pennsylvania. I'm actually going to have a model of the Westinghouse, and there's a lot of models license in this. It's not going to be <laughs> super prototypical. I just don't have the room for it. But I, do, I am going to have a transformer factory on my layout. Uh, and it's going to be based on Westinghouse and Sharon PA. So that's the, the era, uh, the vintage, and the information I'm interested in. So that's what this is going to start to cover. All right, so what's going to be in this, in this clinic? And it's not going to be technical. 
uh, you know, since this is on my YouTube channel, this may get out to a little broader audience than a bunch of model editors. So people out there are probably going to know more than me. This is by nature general, not specific. Some things here I'm sure you could add a lot more details to. I know that, but again, it's more geared just for some general knowledge uh, for model editors to understand the transformers and the, and the systems that they, that they serve in. All right, so we're going to cover what a transformer is and what it does. Uh, a real brief grid overview just to give you a background of where these transformers actually fit in the power grid. I'll talk a little bit about the different transformer types. We'll go back into the, again, to the mid-50s era and talk about the major manufacturers that were manufacturing transformers in that era. Then we'll flip kind of the next topics are kind of modeling-based, uh, what major components are on transformers, and then, uh, you know, considerations for modeling those components, and also some other things modeling-wise that you should be aware of. Uh, again, era-specific to the, to the mid-late 1950s. We're not going to talk about small distribution units, instrument transformers, pad mounts, pole mounts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There's a lot of different types of transformers out there. I'm talking mainly uh, the power transformers uh, in the in the uh, utility system or a large industrial complex. And again, why? More for everyone to get some of an awareness of the use and some era specific considerations for transformers, either as loads or in substations uh, slash industrial settings. All right, what is a power transformer? Well, very, very simply, it's a device that transforms voltage and current from one level to another. This can be stepped up or stepped down. They can be single or three phase. They can be core form or shell form. And they're used in utility systems and for industrial applications such as chemical plants, steel mills, etc. Uh, there are mobile type units that are trailer mounted for emergency use by utilities, which are really cool. Um, and I'm probably going to have a separate clinic just on those because they are so unique and they are, and they are to me, really, really interesting. But those are the <clears throat> other type of units that we may cover at some point in the future. Okay, what is not a power transformer? I, I get a kick out of this. Up here in the upper left is a three-phase oil circuit breaker. And just because it has bushings on it, I often see either in posted photographs or even in the modeling press that, oh, it's a transformer. No, that's an oil circuit breaker. This is a generator. This is some type of vessel. Uh, again, it's a Westinghouse vessel. I don't know if it's for a new plant or what it's for, but it is some type of large vessel. These are sort of transformers. These are small 75 kVA regulators. Now, this here is a mobile. As you can see, it's a trailer. It, is, it happens to be shipping out of the Westinghouse plant. So that actually is a transformer, basically a mobile substation on wheels. Now, this is Optimus Prime. Now, he's cool. He is a transformer, but that's not really what I'm referring to when I talk about a power transformer. All right, an overview of the grid. Again, very generic. If there's any power engineers out there, just relax. <laughs> this is by nature kind of a, just a real brief overview. So basically, you start off at the power plant. Power is generated there, mostly in the 13 to 24 kV range. That's the voltage out of the generators. And they are then attached to what's called a GSU, or a generator step-up transformer. That steps up the voltage to the transmission level, which can be anywhere from 230 to 765 kV, and some higher. I believe they're getting up to a million volts in some places, maybe even more. You know, I'm not a systems guy, but... I believe they are trying to increase this upper range of the voltage. In amongst the high voltage transmission lines, you can often see older transformers, which are used very often, in my experience, as it's like inner ties. You're coming in from a 345 kV system, and you're going to go down to a 230 kV system. You won't really use a, a true step down. It'll be an auto transformer, which is a whole beast unto itself, but it's just a different type of transformer that is used oftentimes when the voltage ratio is in the, in the two to one range and you're coupling between various transmission lines. Then you get into a step down and you're stepping down from your transmission voltage into the 138 to 69 kV range. This is kind of the sub transmission area. Oftentimes at this level, 
you might tap off of that into a large industrial customer, you know, be it a steel mill with furnace transformers, rectifier, regular type transformers. So those transformers will, will step off the sub-transmission line. You come a little further down the stream and you step down again into the more typical distribution range of between 34.4 to 13 kV. And then from there, that's where you get down into your industrial customers, the smaller type industrial customers at the 4160, 2400 volt range, your larger commercial customers, perhaps at 480, 230 volts, and then your residential customers that might be in the 230 to 115 volt range. So again, kind of a brief overview of the grid, how it stepped up from the power plant at a GSU transformer and transmitted. You go down to a sub-transmission heavy industrial range, then down into your typical distribution range to smaller industrials, commercials, and residentials. All right, so I mentioned some of this, the various transformer types. Again, at the power plant, you have your GSU or generator step up. Those are almost always at power plants because it's a generator step up and that's where the generators are. So <laughs> that's where the GSUs are. Again, all transformers and there's other uses for these, but a lot of the times you'll find them in transmission interconnects. The substation transformer is when you're going from the transmission level down to the distribution level or a distribution transformer. Now you're stepping it down to the various distribution levels based on voltage. You have your industrial transformers, which can be furnace, regulator, rectifier, sorry, regulator transformers used in various industrial, chemical, steel, you know, heavy industry areas. Uh, a very unique type of auto transformer, usually, is a phase angular regulating or phase shifting transformer used in inner ties. Uh, these are used quite a bit, I believe, in the inner tie from the eastern and western grids, where you can physically change the phase angle to adjust the power flow. Uh, on the grids as needed based on loading, et, et cetera. So really, really interesting transformers. Not going to cover it here because now we're really getting into the weeds, but these are really interesting transformers. All right, so following are some examples from the Westinghouse Sharon PA facility in the 50s to early 60s. I tried the best I could to get photographs from the era that I'm actually modeling and of, and of interest to me. So let's take a look at some of these photographs. All right, here's a GSU transformer. It's a shell form. You can kind of glean that it's a GSU. It has multiple low voltage bushings. These connect to the generators. Most likely these are in parallel because of the power involved. Um, you'll notice it has a, it's a large enough transformer. Here's a nicely dressed gentleman down here. So that gives you an idea of the scale of the transformer. It's a pretty big unit. And it's got a bolted cover. You can see along here, this is all bolted. So this will probably ship with a shipping cover on it due to height considerations. I did not have on the back of this photograph, I could not get the ratings or the customer information. However, it was dated in November of 1957. So that's a typical Westinghouse transformer. This is in the Sharon facility in late 1957, a generator step-up transformer. Here's an auto transformer. Again, it's also a shell form. Again, for reference, here's a gentleman here checking it out so you can see where the re relative size of the, of the unit. You can tell because the high and low bushings are, now it's actually line and common or series and common, but anyway, but the bushings are similar size, so they're similarly rated, so they're close in rating, so that kind of leads one to think that it's most likely an auto transformer. Again, the rating customer is not known. However, the date kind of pins it to the late 50s based on the coolers here. This is when Westinghouse switched to these coolers, that's the time frame they were used. So that's the best example I could find of an auto transformer. Okay, here's a substation type transformer. This is a core form transformer. It does have a conservator tank. You can see the rating. It's a 20 MVA. 20, 26, 6, 33, 3. Most of these are triple rated transformers. 110 kV down to 46.24. So that's right in that range from the sub transmission to the distribution, the, the kind of the initial distribution voltage range. Uh, you can see it's got pumps for cooling, it's got radiators, again, the conservator tank. And this particular transformer, 
was for the Duke Power Company, and it stated and was manufactured in February of 1962. This is a getting into the range of a distribution transformer. Again, it's a core form. It does have a low tap changer. You can see it's rated 7,500 kVA. So that is right in that range. This is right at smack in the in the distribution range, jumping down from 67 kV to 13.8, which is kind of your, your typical distribution voltage, your low low voltage distribution type. It's for Gulf States Utilities. Again, this gentleman here gives you a relative idea of the size of the unit. This particular one has welded on tube type radiators, which was, which was common in that era. Unfortunately, I didn't have the date. But again, all of these are from the from the late 50s and the early 60s. I would place this probably in the early 60s. Now here's a pure distribution transformer. Again, the nicely dressed young lady here gives you an idea of the scale. Uh, it's it's a smaller type transformer. Actually, I know people might say that's big, but in, in my world, this is a very small transformer. Um, it's 1,000 kVA, three phase, stepping from 13.8 to 480. So this is probably something you would see outside of a, you know, a strip mall, a small industrial customer, uh, you know, something like that. It's right in that, in the sweet spot range for being a small distribution type transformer. Let's go into United Engines and Contract Constructors. They were probably a sub, you know, that was building some type of infrastructure that needed transformers. So that is a real good example of that size and type of transformer. This is a power regulator for Virginia Electric and Power. It's a core form. And you can see from the voltage, it's, it's only regulated from 138 to 115. It's not an auto. Now, the back of the photo did call it a power regulator. So it was, it was something they were using. I don't know exactly what. Uh, it's not a huge unit, 40 NVA, three phase. But you can see there's not a whole lot of voltage difference. So it was trying to do something to keep the voltage within a certain range for whatever use uh, VEPCO had for it at that particular time period. This is a furnace transformer for Shea Chemical Company. This is dated June of 1956, so again, right perfectly in the era that I'm interested in. Core form unit, 28 MVA, three phase, 44 kV, down to 450 volts on the low. So if you do the mathematics, you'll see there's quite a bit of current on these furnace transformers. They, they actually provide dead shorts right into the furnaces. So these are really robust transformers. Uh, these large looking contraptions here are the FOW forced oil water cooled. These are actually water cooled, not inside the transformer. That would be extremely bad for the unit itself. But the oil is pumped through these. Then the customer provides cooling water, which is pumped through them because of the large amount of uh, heat transfer that's required, a normal oil cooling with fans and pumps just can't handle it, so they have to step it up a notch, so to speak, and use forced water to draw away the heat from inside the transformer. Very, very common on these large industrial type transformers. As you can see the scale, there's a nice gentleman there giving us a friendly little wave on this really cool looking CNO flat car. So anyway, so that is a furnace transformer. June 1956. All right, the major manufacturers that in the late 50s, whose units you would tend to see on your model railroad, on your rail cars being shipped in substations, etc. This is not all of them. There were more, I'm sure. I wasn't around in this era. So these are the major players that were around at that time period. You have Aulis Chalmers. Aulis Chalmers uh, was in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. They were in business from, again, these dates are approximate, best I could come up, 1927 to 1975, and they built core and shell form units. GE, obviously one of the major manufacturers out of their Pittsfield, Massachusetts LTO, or Large Transformer Operation Headquarters. They were there from 1907 to 1987 when they sold to Westinghouse. They built core form. And, and I can say they, <laughs> some of the old timers told me, I've not confirmed this, that 
GE did build a few shell form transformers that were used under Grand Central Terminal as part of the frequency conversion for, for the railroad there. So I've never seen pictures of those. I don't know that as fact, but I was told that. But for really, if you think GE, they're, they're all core form. The McGraw Edison Company in Cannonsburg, PA, from the 1920s to, I say to present, um, they're not McGraw anymore. Their lineage is McGraw. They're now currently Pennsylvania Transformer Technologies Incorporated in the same facility. Uh, they've been through some ups and downs and closed for a while and been bought and sold a little bit, but they are still there. But back in this era, the McGraw Edison Company was building both core and shell form transformers. Maloney Transformers out of St. Louis, Missouri, was in business from the late 1890s, 1898-ish, into the 60s. They built core form transformers. And, of course, Westinghouse, well, probably one of the other major players, you know, GE Westinghouse and McGraw, but probably, you know, GE Westinghouse being the biggest, then McGraw, followed by Alice Chalmers and Maloney. Okay, so Westinghouse was in Sharon, 1922 to roughly 1985, when that facility closed and the work was transferred out to Muncie, Indiana, and St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, and they built core and shell form transformers. So in that era, late 50s, these are the major manufacturers that you would tend to see on your layouts. All right, let's talk components. Now here we're going to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty of what's on these transformers. Uh, as you go through this, you know, a lot of the models that are out there don't include a lot of this for various reasons. You're starting to get really small, you're starting to get really detailed, but I wanted to give an overview of these components for your knowledge. And if you decide you want to model them, that's great. I'm still learning, uh, working on how to model some of these things, and I, but we'll get there. And that could be in future clinics. So let's kind of run through what we have here. So this is a, a GE Rome transformer, actually. It's kind of the one of the better pictures I could find that I was able to point out some of these components. It seems a lot of photographers aren't taking pictures of these for us model railroaders to look at. So <laughs> imagine that. All right, so this is a lightning arrestor. This is used uh, basically <clears throat> as the name implies. Uh, if there's a lightning strike nearby, it is to, it'll flash over, it'll, it'll you know, shunt the, the high voltage away from the transformer itself. This is a, a bushing, a high voltage bushing, not an insulator. I've seen these called insulators. It, it's sort of what it does, but in, in the field, they're called bushings. And of course, up top, you have a connector, a bushing terminal connector to connect it to the line. In this case, it it's, goes right through the top of the surge arrestor and then out to the line. Many, many transformers in this substation range have what's called a load tap changer. That'll vary the, usually, it'll vary the secondary voltage to keep it steady, uh, adjusting for, you know, it drops along the line to keep a constant voltage at the actual load. Uh, in case there is a load, a voltage sensitive load, this can adjust automatically to keep the low voltage in per, within the parameters that the customer needs. You'll see there's valves, a lot of valves on these transformers. And I have a separate slide on that coming up because that's, that's, I've never seen valves on any model transformer yet. These are going to be, basically think of any oil filled compartment. You have to drain it, you have to fill it. So it's going to have to have valves on it. So they're a very, very important detail to include. Most transformers are going to have a main control cabinet, which will look like a separate box mounted on the side of the transformer. Uh, there'll be a nameplate on it. Depends on the age of it. can be very, very difficult to read out in the field, <laughs> which is kind of a pain sometimes, but they, almost every transformer will have a nameplate on it. This has got, again, these are the customer's lines coming up into a knockout panel on the bottom of the control cabinet for customer's use. This is an oil pump, part of the cooling system. That's going to circulate oil out to the radiators. Notice the base. The base, these aren't usually flat. They're usually on some type of channel, a channeled base that is designed to support the core and coil inside and also allows it to be jacked and skidded into position. So very rarely are these actually flat. They're often on, on some type of base. Right here is the jack pad. That's where the transformer can physically be jacked 
Again, the way you can move these without a crane is to jack and slide them, which is often done in the field. So the, the, the manufacturer will provide an area where it's designed to safely jack the entire transformer. Here at the bottom is part of the protective apparatus on it. That's a fault pressure relay that is designed to detect rapid changes in internal pressure. And then most of these are designed to actually trip the unit offline with a sealing relay so then the customer can come out and investigate what caused the pressure rise. Gauges. There's always gauges on all these transformers. Again, a very seldom modeled item. There's going to be gauges for the liquid temperature, for the winding temperature. Up here is a liquid level gauge that gives you the, gate, the level of the oil in the compartment. So every compartment that's oil filled will usually have an oil level gauge. Right here, it's hard to see. That's a pressure vacuum gauge that tells you the pressure on the transformer. This unit has a level gauge. I don't know where exactly where it is. It might be over here where it's out of view. But trust me, the main tank has a liquid level gauge on it. These large rectangular items here are vacuum braces. You'll see there's one, two, three on the front of this transformer. There's three smaller ones here across the end. Those are designed for the unit to be able to take full vacuum. Not all transformers can. You have to read the nameplate. It tells you if it's braced for full vacuum. But many, many of them are starting in the 50s era. They're braced for full vacuum. And I mean full vacuum. You could literally take it down to full vacuum and the tank would not collapse. Here is a lifting lug. You'll notice four of them. There's one on each corner. That's to lift the entire transformer. In this case, in some cases, I'll show you on shell transformers, these may not be designed to lift the entire transformer, but only the, the top part of the tank. Over here, we have our low voltage bushings, the low voltage bushing connector, and this is got, happens to have a tube type line coming in. So those, that's, those are all the low voltage lines. On this unit here on the back, you can see the radiators and fans. The radiators, obviously, oil flows through those, cools off through natural convection, and then the fans are there to help. The pumps then are used to pump the oil. So there's different ways. I'm not going to get into it. There's different ways you can cool these transformers based on the loading and the thermal characteristics. But very often you'll see some variety of radiators and or coolers with fans and pumps. Looking at the top of the transformer, which, let's be honest, this is what most of us are going to see on our model railroads. These are some of the details that should be on top of a transformer that unfortunately are often overlooked. These are high voltage bushing covers. There may or may not be adapters that go with it, but these are bolted on covers. That are These are on for, for shipment. This is actually coming into one of our repair facilities. So this unit has been stripped for shipment. There's three high voltage covers. There's four low voltage, probably for a neutral. So those are, again, the uh, basically just cover plates for the bushing holes. These are manhole covers for access into the transformer. You'll notice there's four lifting lugs. Those are for lifting the cover only. Trust me, you don't want to try to lift the whole unit, <laughs> which, which has been done with dire consequences. You, know, you, you very quickly end up ripping one of these off. So they're for handling the cover itself. You can see the cover, in this case, is welded on. It's stepped back, usually an inch, inch and a half, two inches, depends on the manufacturer, and then it's welded on. So that's a detail you should include. It doesn't come right to the edge. The tank will come up and kind of flare out a little bit, and then the cover sits on top of that. This is a protective device, another type of mechanical pressure relief device. It responds to increases in pressure inside the transformer, usually at a slower rate. Many of these are set to operate, it depends, between 8 to 12 pounds per square inch. Again, there's a different range on these. This one's hard to see. There's a little yellow pin that'll pop up once it burps. If one of these goes off, we say the transformer has burped. Although it could be a very, very bad event, not just a normal burp. Anyway, um, but that is, a, it pops up. It often has an alarm and a flag on it. So if it does activate, 
the customer will get an, an alarm. Here's a view of the lifting lug from the top. Again, these are designed, it's a core form transformer, so these are designed to lift the entire transformer. Up here, this is a little bit more modern. Again, I couldn't find a real good view from the 1950s that shows this. This is, to me, it looks like it's for mounting a fall, fall arrest pole. A lot of customers nowadays, due to obvious safety concerns with, uh, heaven forbid, falling off the top of a transformer, this is to mount a fall arrest pole where workers get in with their, with their lanyard, they can tie off to it. So they're protected from falling off the edge of the transformer while they're working it at height on top of the unit. This is a hot spot outlet. This is for the, uh, the, I mentioned the winding temperature gauge. It isn't a true temperature gauge. It's a simulation. It, nowadays, we are getting to the point where we're putting fiber optics into coils, but back in this era, it's a simulation using a current transformer, usually on the middle phase of the low voltage, and it's calibrated to give you an indication of what the winding temperature is. There's some debate as to how accurate they are, but there's some other items. If you see something like that, that's the hot spot. There's a little resistor in this thing that you can calibrate at the factory before you ship it. So the gauge reads a simulation of the winding temperature. So that's the hot spot CT outlet. This is the current transformer outlet itself. Many, many of these transformers will have current transformers for customer use, either in metering or relaying, mostly in relaying. And again, they're used by the customers for all types of different uses. They come out, they're wired out to uh, different types of apparatus, to different boards that bring them outside the tank, and then wired down to the control cam at the terminal boards for the customer's use. All right, some era specific, just to show what these looked like. This is, a, this is an enlargement of the transformer we saw previously. There's the current transformer outlet. That's a typical Westinghouse rectangular plate with small little studs where all the CT wires come out. And the one thing that Westinghouse did that's kind of unique and also kind of a pain when you're working on it is you can see they ran off, they ran their wiring in the vacuum braces. That's why these holes are here. That's great, but it can be really hard to deal with that when you're in the field working on it. But anyway, but oftentimes Westinghouse ran them in, in the actual vacuum braces. Again, here are the vacuum braces. This design's got several vertical ones, and actually one across here, which is probably more to mount the bushings than anything. But then you can see the six bushings. Here's all their gauges. Here's a liquid level gauge, probably a winding temperature, a liquid temperature, and a pressure vacuum gauge. Up here, a little hard to read. It's pretty high on the transformer. Oftentimes, these are right on top of the control cabinet, so you can see them. The liquid level gauges are up usually pretty high because there's a little cork neoprene float in there that gives you the level indication so that they need to be high on the transformer. Now here you'll see lifting lugs. Here's a lifting lug here and a lifting lug here. Those are not for the entire transformer. These lifting lugs, and there's four of them, one on each corner, that's to lift this top tank section. This lifting lug is to lift the middle section. And then the base is the base. So when this unit is assembled, the middle section goes on, the top section goes on. This is bolted on here. Again, in, in the factory for tests, I'm sure this comes off when it ships. But again, these are not to lift the entire transformer, just the associated tank sections themselves. The valves. Now, when I, I wanted to bring this out because this is a real important detail that I can't give bonus points to anyone I've seen <laughs> who, who have modeled transformers. But these got to be on every transformer. Again, any oil-filled compartment, you've got to drain it and you've got to fill it. And oftentimes, you're, you're going to circulate oil to filter and, and condition the oil. So you got to have valves. This here is most likely an upper filter press valve for the top of the tank. Down here on the, on the main tank as well, you'll see, and I, know, I know it's hard to see. Maybe I can see I can do this here, and I couldn't do this when I was live, but... As you'll see, ah, let me go back, go back, go back. Try to do this just right. Okay, that's the main drain valve. You can see up here what these sizes usually are. They're typical. They're usually globe, although they're both. They're gate and globe, it depends. And some, it depends what the customer wants. 
but the main drain valve is usually a three to five inch, usually, with a sampler to take an oil sample. That's because you want a nice large diameter when you're draining the entire unit so it doesn't take forever. The upper and lower filter press drains are often in the one to two inch. Same for the upper, I'm sorry, for the upper and lower filter press. And some main drains are smaller in that range, but again, it's going to take a long time on a big unit to do that if you have a smaller valve. You will also see, as I point out here, these are two other oil filled compartments. So there's a valve up top, and a little hard to see, but there's valves here as well on the bottom. So again, any compartment, at a minimum, you get bonus points if you put a, a valve at the bottom and a valve at the top. And it isn't that difficult to do. At least I know in HO scale, I've purchased several uh, cow scale, precision craft, uh, valve, and they're pretty good looking. And they're right in the, in the right range. At least they're going to be good enough for a transformer. No one's going to come in and pick at you and say that should be a globe valve and it's a gate valve or whatever. Don't worry about it. Just go out and get a valve and put it on your oil filled compartments because the, the poor customer and the field guys need a way to access the oil inside the transformer. Very, very important. All right, so back on the components, looking at this end of the transformer. These are heat exchangers or coolers. There's basically radiator tubes inside here in a bundle. The oil is brought out through this top header. These are valved so that they can be shut and in theory taken off without oil leaking out of the transformer. That depends how good your, your gasket is in your shutoff valve. But it has been done. Oil is forced through, the fans draw cool air across it and it cools it out. At the bottom you have the oil pump. On every oil pump, I shouldn't say that, on most oil pumps or an associated elbow or flange, there's going to be an oil flow indicator that basically when the pumps turn on, it just, it's, it's pump on or pump off, pump on. Just so you know, looking at it, that the oil is flowing. And often we'll have an alarm contact as well so the customer knows that normally lights will go on or whatever when the pumps turn on. Or if it doesn't, it could mean you have a faulty pump, you've got something clogged, or it could be a defective flow gauge. But normally there is an indication, an alarm contact in these flow gauges. These here the Westinghouse design, this is the base of a shell form transformer. This is how Westinghouse lifted the entire unit. That's why they're kind of angled out and as large as they are. They changed their design over time, but at this point, that is how they would rig this transformer off these bottom. And it probably also, I can't exactly tell, I have to look at an outline drawing, it may also double as the jacking location for the transformer. So here are the lifting lugs again, just for the top section. They would be used to take this top section here, lower it onto the base, which is then welded here to make the entire transformer tank. Okay, this is a GE transformer, Mark II design out in the field. This is, a, this is actually more of a, of a mid-late 60s design, but it just shows some of the various components as well and how they vary a little bit across manufacturers. These are the, the uh, GE coolers. See, they look a little bit differently. That is their conservator tank, which is rectangular. More on that in a moment. There's a level gauge right there. Here is the hotspot outlet lifting lugs for the entire tank in this, in this case. That's how GE designed them. Your main control cabinet. As I mentioned, the gauges, it's hard to see. I wish I would have removed this railing, but the gauges are right here. That's most likely your liquid temperature and winding temperature. The liquid level gauge happens to be here because that's where the oil is up inside the conservator. The pumps, rectangular design at the bottom. GE changes around quite a bit. Some are at the bottom, some at the top. They, when they, they vary quite a bit over time. And then there's your oil flow gauge. So that's how GE interpreted some of these devices. Talking about oil preservation, very, very critical part of a transformer. There's two main types. There is what they call a, a, an inert gas system or a seal tank or positive pressure system. What it is, you've got your transformer immersed in your transformer oil, which is your, you know, your, your cooling fluid. Above it, you have a gas space. 
Into that gas base, you pump an, an inert gas, almost always nitrogen. It's in a nitrogen bottle. It goes into a small cabinet on the side of the transformer. And you'll see this a lot if you look at, at transformers. Even back in this era, these started back in the mid-20s. So these are certainly applicable to the, to the mid-50s era. This in here will have a pressure vacuum gauge, some controls, and some alarms that can alarm the customer if the pressure is low, if the bottle is getting low, etc., etc. And then there's two lines that go up that feed the nitrogen in and then monitor the, the pressure in the gas space. The other type is called, it's called different names by different manufacturers. It's basically a conservator or expansion tank system where the oil is completely, it completely fills the main tank. There's piping that takes it into an expansion or what they call a conservator tank where the liquid level is normally set. On top of that, there's a, there's a bladder, a heavy rubber bladder, and that is what breathes in the outside air. So in this type of design, the transformer liquid never touches the outside air. The air is contained inside this bladder. These are used on larger transformers where you need better cooling and you don't have a lot, you just don't have time, the room for a gas space into the transformer without, without making the tank just too darn big. There are many different types of designs for these tanks. For the most part, again, in generalities, for GEs, they made round, rectangular, and most commonly elliptical type tanks. Westinghouse's, the ones I've seen, have almost always been round. McGraw had rectangular or round. So there's different manufacturers, have different designs. They all do the same thing. It just depends on the manufacturer how they wanted to design their expansion tank. Usually in the piping in between, there is what's called a Buchholz relay or a gas detector relay. Since if a transformer gases and has combustible gases, it will tend to come up in the oil and bubble up higher. So this relay will, will detect that. Almost always in court, some type of gas detection relay is incorporated in, in nearly every, I hate to say always, that's a long time, but in, in nearly everyone that I've seen, there is some type of protection to detect gases in a conservator design. Some of the major components, what do they actually look like? And these are actually from the era. I was actually lucky enough to have access to some Westinghouse instruction books from the mid-1950s. So this is a liquid temperature gauge. These are usually, almost, even across manufacturers, very, very similar. This is roughly a six-inch diameter. So you can model that. I mean, that's large enough to be seen. You can see it's got, a, it can have a different type of range, usually zero to 160. There's usually a red indicated arm that gives you the latest maximum temperature. There's alarm contacts in there. This is a capillary. This is what actually runs up into the transformer to read the temperature. This will be the controls for the alarm contacts down at the control cabinet. So th this is definitely a large enough device that we could model it on our transformers. Very similar is the winding temperature gauge. It's really the same gauge, they just label it differently. It might have one additional contact on it for customers use maybe to, to trip a unit off. These can both be used to control fans and pumps if needed. So they're very, very similar in design. It's just, they, they just call one a winding temperature, one a liquid temperature. This is the liquid level gauge. Again, you can see it's got a float on the back, and this is why they tend to be higher on the transformer. As this floats up and down, it'll go from low, 25C, which is considered normal, up to high. And again, these often have alarm contacts as well. Usually a low and a high, depends on the customer. There could be multiple contacts. A lot of this can be customized, whatever they desire they get, but usually a low and a high alarm. Here's your oil flow gauge. Again, this little flapper sits in the inside the, the piping. And as the pump turns on, it will then, boom, slap this thing up to pump on. It's very, very visible. It is very easy to see. It is very, very distinct. And if it's not hooked up right, because it is easy to put this in the wrong way, this will kind of just flutter. So you can tell right away if you've got your gauge on correctly. The mechanical pressure relief device that I mentioned, these came into vogue starting in the 40s, and there's some different designs. This is the GE design circa 1958. This is the Westinghouse design circa 1940s. What happens is when this pops, it, 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 it uh, 
sets an alarm off. This is a similar design. When this one pops, it comes up off of this little right angle bend, and this sticks out of the transformer. So they give you a visual indication, if you're looking for it, that something happened to the transformer. These are very, very common. Now, most of these have been replaced by newer devices, but in the era we're talking about, this is what you see on top of the transformer. Just another view. Again, there is, this is, a, this is cool. This is actually a 1957 Sharon transformer, 54 MVA, 230 to 13.8, three-phase shell for PG&E out in California. Still in service. Uh, I got this from a friend of mine who works in our, in our uh, Los Angeles facility. He said he was working on the Westinghouse shell. I was like, ooh, ooh, give me pictures. So here, one of the units, there's, there's three of these units. One has the old Westinghouse pressure relief device. This unit's been retrofitted. So you can see in this case, they have a new adapter plate and one of the newer mechanical pressure relief devices. Here's the little indicator, which we call a banana. So that little pin would pop up. This banana, semaphore, pops up so you can see it. And here's the alarm contacts. So that's the more modern version of the old Westinghouse design. This is just a, um, a tap changer drive mechanism to change taps on the high voltage bushing. Here's your lifting lug again for the upper section of the tank. Here's an old Wessinghouse sud pressure relay, again designed to react to much more rapid rises in pressure than this device is. This will, it's allegedly it'll, it'll react within a, in a few cycles. Um, uh, there's still some debate on that, but I, I, I've never actually seen one of these operate. Thankfully, been around a failure, so I can't say for sure, but they're supposed to operate much, much quicker. Here is a high voltage bushing adapter. You can see it's angled. The high voltage bushing is coming in here. This is the adapter plate. So in the field, they would take off the shipping cover, bolt this adapter on, and then mount the bushing. Okay. Let's get into some of the considerations when we model these beasts. Things change over time, just like many rail cars, even locomotives over its lifetime. Things change over the eras from the, you know, the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s into the modern era. Things changed. Transformer tank designs changed. They vary by manufacturer as well. The transformer tank colors varied over time. The bushing colors varied over time. I'm going to touch a little bit on core form versus shell form. And I'll talk about one real cool thing that I just discovered in my research. Back in this era, especially up through, I'm not sure how far, I'll say into the 60s before the practice stopped, these shipments had some really interesting promotional signage on them. And I'll show some examples of that. Okay, so for the Tank designs, or it certainly changed quite a bit. Again, this will be kind of generic in general. I'm no expert on this. I wasn't around for a lot of this. But based on what I could ascertain, this is what I can, as general guidelines for how tank designs changed. These two photographs are Westinghouse Sharon units. Back in this time, eh, I'm going to say the late 20s to the early 30s, you see a lot of round and oval designs. This one here has got all kinds of welded on radiators. I'm not sure how you'd model that. I'm not going to try that, I don't think. But if you do, good luck. Let me know how it works out. Again, as you can see, it's got a bolted cover. So that's an oval tank design. Here's a round tank design. Again, with a bolted cover. And here's, where start, here's the promotional signage. Westinghouse Electric on that one, on this one. And you can also see some of the dunnage that is used to block and brace these transformers when they ship. And I plan, again, to do a whole other clinic on how these are loaded for shipment and whatnot. So, late 20s, early 30s-ish, these photographs are both from that time frame, round and oval designs. Somewhere, in, I'm not sure what to call this. Uh, again, in, in the same era, I, I'm calling these tapered rectangular. I cannot find anyone from Westinghouse to tell me what these are. I'm thinking these are larger transformers, and you can see how the, the ends kind of angled out, tapered out a little bit all the way around it. 
Here's a tank laying down. There's another one here. See, they're all similar design. I'm not sure what they called them. I'm not sure exactly the time frame these were used. This one seems to have vacuum braces on it. This one does not. So I don't know if this unit's even braced for full vacuum. You can see a lot of these are like that. Here's a, This is cool. Here's a guy on top of a unit, no harness. Good Lord, using ladders, not a man lift. Don't tell OSHA. <laughs> and here you can see one of the round designs. Smaller one here with the weld-on radiator. So both of these were in use at that time period. I just don't know what Westinghouse might have called these or how long it was in service, how long they were used in that particular design. But again, you'll see them mostly into the early 30s before they changed their design yet again to, ta-da, this is the typical 1950s into the 60s and later Westinghouse shell form transformers. Here's the, the base, it's a rectangular design, a rectangular tank design, all rectangular now. Vacuum braces on this one are vertical. Obviously this is the third 190 MVA unit for Detroit Edison. This is definitely a 1950s vintage. And look right here, look at that. That tiny thing there is the nameplate. Westinghouse had notoriously small nameplates. I don't know why. Anyway, <laughs> this here is another larger transformer. This is for Con Edison in New York. You can see the vacuum braces, a little bit more extensive. This has got a low tap changer here off the end of the transformer. This is all bolted on, so this tells me this is a shipping cover. Going into New York City, it probably had a lot of uh, clearance issues to deal with. So they had to give it a shipping cover to get it across the railroad and into the customer location. So you'll see that similar type of progression with other manufacturers as well, going from rounded, oval, to rectangular. Now here's some Aulis Chalmers transformers. I couldn't get real good photographs. I apologize for that. These are out of some uh, advertising literature I was able to come up with. This is a circa 1950, again, oval type. Aulis Chalmers, a larger unit. Hard to tell, but it's rectangular <laughs> with bank radiators. Here's a low tap changer and their expansion tank on it. A 1940 vintage transformer. That looks a lot like, I'll show you some examples. That looks like, uh, I've seen models of this, and that looks a lot like the typical Aulis Chalmers unit, larger type unit of that era. And again, here is the Aulis Chalmers promotional signage on the transformer as it's shipping. Now for GE, again, it's similar. Here's kind of a... I can't call it oval. It's got more of a, it's got rounded tanks, rounded edges here at the, at the end of the tank. That's a circa 1955 unit, and there's the GE sign on it. They switched to a, almost a pure rec rectangular design. This is greater than 1958, only because looking at the build date on this, on this Erie flat car, it was built in 58, so that places this as 58 or later. And again, there's the GE Pittsfield advertising signage and again both units have rounded corners this one here you can see a little easier to see because there's no tap changer on it and again this was a little bit different here are the coolers here's the pumps on top this time you know that that, that according to some of long-term GE Pittsburgh employees that was about the late 50s when they went away from that design so I'm, I'm putting this somewhere in the 50s for this particular transformer shipment and you can see a lot of these shipments have got other crates and goodies on the flat cars as they ship from the factory. This is a 37.5 MV Maloney transformer. This is actually coming into the shop where I worked in Philly. We uh, repaired this transformer, rewound it, put a new tap changer on it. Really cool project. But that's uh, kind of typical of what a 38 MVA, 66 KV Maloney transformer looked like. This was built in 1957 from the St. Louis, Missouri factory. And I really struggled to get any good pictures of McGraw units. Again, this is from some of their instruction books I was able to obtain. This is a shell form unit circa 1950. 
this is actually a particular design. One of the guys told me what it was, and I, I, I forget. But this was a period in time when they designed it with a cover like that. This is a core form unit. Again, typical core form, rectangular tank, vacuum braces, radiators, low tap changer here at the end. So these are typical McGraw units from the, eh, let's say, mid-1950s. Now, another thing that changed in, a different, in addition to the actual tank design was the color of the tanks. This is kind of hard to say. Again, I'm going to speak in generalities. For the most part, the most common color I've seen from the 20s through the 60s was what we call a blue-gray color. GE called it that. I've seen it on outline drawings. They specify a GE blue-gray. I've never been able to get any actually color specifics for it, but they call it a blue-gray color. However, there's also what looked to be light gray, maybe even silver. Kind of hard to say. Although I have seen light gray, silver, Berkshire green was a color that GE out of Pittsfield did quite a bit. Uh, tan sand units for units that were moving out to the west uh, in, in the desert region. A black transformer is most likely going to be a network unit. It's very heavy black paint for being submersed uh, in, in the subways and underground. And again, this is customer specified. There's many variations. But in general, in the area that I'm interested in, it's this. This is a GE Pittsfield unit here. It's this blue-gray color. That's an actual Pittsfield unit. You can tell it's kind of faded coming in, into our facility in Philadelphia. This is a newer one going out, so I'm not saying they match the paint perfectly, but that's a rough idea of the blue-gray color that was very, very common uh, in, in the 50s era. More recently, what you're going to see if you go out driving around looking at substations nowadays, most likely, will be what's called the ANSI 70 light gray color. These are two units painted in that color. This is a repainted Westinghouse shell transformer. This is a transformer from uh, PTTI up in our Stony Creek facility in Canada. And that's the color nowadays that you're going to tend to see. There are also other ANSI color designations that customers specify. ANSI 49, 61, 71, etc. 71 is, is a dark gray. Or maybe 61 is the dark gray. I forget. They aren't used as often, but they are other color designations. But again, in general, most likely... You're going to see the ANSI 70 light gray from the late 60s into the present era. Now, along with the tank colors changing, the bushing colors changed. Back in the era from the, let's say, the 20s, 30s, up through the late 60s, they were chocolate brown. And you know, this is the best color I could get. Um, and similar colors were used on Lightning the Rest as well. It's called chocolate brown, to the best of my knowledge. You still can buy them that way, I believe. But most bushings after, again, at the same time the tanks started changing to the ANSI 70 light gray, the bushings did as well. So here you can see what the bushings look like now, being the ANSI 70 light gray. So back in the era of the 50s, I'm almost confident saying you're only going to see a chocolate brown bushing. You would not see a gray bushing back into, into the 40s and 50s. In the modern era, you're most likely going to see gray, but there still can be some brown ones out there. If the bushings are fine and they're working, customer leaves them in place, maybe one of them goes bad, has a high power factor, they pull it out, swap it with a new one. So you may see one brown and other gray on the same transformer after the 1960s. Not uncommon to see that, but back in the 50s, you're probably only going to see chocolate brown. And they are porcelain, so they're a glossy type finish. They're not a flat finish. This is, kind of shows, a, I kind of intentionally left that one in there because you can see a little bit of light reflecting, but they, these are porcelain, so they are a glossy finish on them. Okay, let's touch a little bit on the difference between a shell form and a core form. The shell form unit, um, not as common nowadays in terms of new manufacture. I believe you still can get them from overseas. 
Uh, Mitsubishi at one time was making them in the States, but I believe they've stopped. So they are out there. Uh, they're very labor intensive, but they're also very, very robust transformers. And the spotting features of them are, start over here, there's a base. This base is where the unit is actually assembled. The core is actually built right on this base. And here's the base when it's assembled. So you'll often be able to see it if you're looking. You'll see a base with a weld on it. That's where the, the tank section is welded to it. Then the unit is built. These are the three, in this case, they're called phase packs. These are the three phases of the transformer. And this is actually an interesting transformer. I think, if you look at that, that's the same one we saw from Con Ed on the other photograph when it was shipping. So I think that's the, that's the inside of that transformer. So it's got the main unit, three phases. This has got what looks to be a series unit, a three-phase shell unit, and it has a three-phase core form reactor in there as well. So a lot going on inside this transformer. So it's built right here on this base. The phase packs are installed, the core is stacked, and then the top tank section is lowered on and welded. And yes, these guys stay inside when this is lowered because the fit here is very, very close. Sixteenth of an inch, so you've got to get it right. So these guys are, are physically going to stay there as the top section is lowered and then once it's set, they'll wiggle up and they'll come outside the top of the transformer. This has got a base and a top section. Like I said, this has got a base, a middle section, and then a top section. Now this unit, because of the size, again, when they're done getting this through factory test, we'll strip all this, unbolt this, this top section will come off and ship separately, and there'll be a smaller shipping cover placed on top. So this is a three-section tank, two-section tank. Most of the Westinghouses were two, not all, but there were obviously some that are three because there's an example of one right there. So that's the, the difference between a shell, and I'll show you the core form next. And again, for Westinghouse, they lifted the entire unit here off these lifting lugs at the bottom. That's how they, they, with, with a spreader bar on their crane, they would drop their, their cables here, hook onto the bottom, four-point lift, and lift from the bottom of the transformer. Now, for a core form transformer, it's a one-piece tank, one piece with a cover. In this case, bolted, but very often it, it will be welded. So the core and coil assembly is manufactured on the floor separately, treated, dried out, then crane lifted, and lowered into the tank itself. Now these guys, again, interesting, they're up there with no harness, no tie-off, don't tell OSHA. But then they're on top to help guide it in from the top. There's no one inside. It's lifted, lowered inside, then the cover is put on and welded on. So that's just, just some spotting points. So you, as you look at some of these, you may be able to tell, oh, that's a core form, that's a shell form, because they're very distinctly different in their manufacturer and visually when you, when you actually go to look at them. Okay, like I mentioned, uh, that's kind of the, the, the overview, basic introduction for model railroaders, for power transformers, different types, how they're used, some of the main components and some modeling considerations if you're going to model some of these for your pikes. Upcoming, here's what I'd like to do for future clinics. Okay, the first one's done. That's this one here, the Large Power Transformer Basics for Model Rotors. The next one I'm working on is modeling power transformers for shipment. That would be on the rail cars, tied down, shipping covers, no shipping covers, uh, how they're stripped. Because a lot of times when they're shipped, they will not have bushings, radiators, coolers. Sometimes they will, depends on the shipping profile, but it's definitely different how they're going to look on a rail car as when they're installed. So I'm working on this one right now, trying to get some information and actually build some models to be able to show as part of that clinic. A whole other clinic can be done on rolling stock. That's on the, especially back in the 50s era. It's really interesting some of the rolling stock I've seen in photographs at the Westinghouse facility, at the Westinghouse facility, excuse me. So I'd like to do a clinic on that. Obviously, being share in PA, being right off the uh, E&P of the Pennsylvania Railroad, a lot of Pensy rolling stock. However, a fair amount of Erie 
large depressed flat cars, New York Central, Reading. It's really interesting. So I'd like to do a whole clinic on some of the different rolling stock that you're, you're going to see in that era. Again, this is in the 1950s, uh, focusing mostly on Westinghouse and Sharon. If you were modeling the GE facility, or if you were more toward New England, you're probably going to tend to see more New York Central, New Haven, uh, although we saw a picture of, of an Erie car at the Pittsfield factory. So just a slight variation depending where in the country you are and what railroads tended to serve that particular factory. I'd like to do a clinic again on modeling a transformer factory. Some of the different things you, that you need uh, from the high bay, oil storage, kerosene uh, for vapor phase. Uh, some of the, you know, again, how you operate that facility, some of the moves you might anticipate, what type of material could be coming in, going out, besides transformers. A lot of other things come into a factory to support the manufacturing operation. So I like to do a whole clinic on that. Do one, as I get to it, actually in a substation. I do have some pretty cool pictures of 50s vintage substations. Again, Westinghouse related but they look kind of different from nowadays. So it's kind of interesting to see that. So I would like to do, again, a, another clinic on modeling a substation in the 50s era. And again, I, like I said, mobile units, really cool. Have some really, really interesting photographs from the Westinghouse Sharon plant of mobile units. They must have done a lot more than I thought. Uh, a lot of them shipping out on rail cars. So it would make some really interesting loads and models to have. Uh, a little bit further out, uh, I need to get through some of this other stuff first, but I would like to do a clinic on modeling mobile units. And again, all focused, late 50s, Westinghouse Sharon facility. Um, and as you're watching this, you don't need to know that, but I will uh, post videos of the progress uh, and advise how things are going on the clinics and as I'm working on the factory on my YouTube channel. But you're watching this video, so at least you're aware of the YouTube channel itself. Okay, that's it. Now, I know you can't ask questions because I'm not doing this live with you guys. But if you do have questions, go ahead and put them in the comments. Let me know what you think. Interesting, not interesting, boring. Uh, do any of these clinics interest you uh, that I might be working on? Uh, I'm still going to work on them, most likely. Uh, there seems to be some interest in that. And I'll try to answer any questions that you may have. Um, I'll come back to this, but note my email. Go ahead and note that down because what, what I'm going to show you now at the clinic, I actually provided a handout. And I'm just going to show you what that was. So bear with me here. Now, this is, again, not all-encompassing. It's somewhat general. But I wanted to, pro to provide the folks that went to the clinic with some general information to kind of help guide them as they're working on the transformers. So we cover here, again, era-based information, manufacturers, kind of who they were roughly throughout the era. And you can see a big shift from the domestic manufacturers to the foreign manufacturers, including from China, Korea, etc., and of course from Europe. So nowadays, there is almost no, in fact, there is no transformer manufacturing facility in the United States that manufactures new transformers. That is an American company. Information on the tank design, again, how it kind of changed over time. The tank color, the bushing color, some of the rail cars that were used. Again, I'll, I'll cover that more in, in the other clinic. But you know, obviously, back in the earlier days, they had flats, they had depressed flats, they had well cars. The Schnabel cars, for those interested, the first Schnabel car, WECX 200, came about in late 1957. That was the first use of a Schnabel car out of Westinghouse Sharon. Then, of course, GE came up with them. Um, so there's over time, and they had additional cars built, and uh, there's more heavier flat cars. Uh, the Schnabel cars tended to move away from the manufacturers to private carriers. Still several out there. Very interesting. A lot of good websites cover some of these. But back in the area I'm in, I'm actually going to do, I do have a model of WECX 200. It's a resin kit, and I got some cool pictures. I can hopefully detail it pretty nice. So back in that area, that's, that's what you tended to see in, in the 1950s. Just a note on the oil preservation, seal tank, nitrogen back in the 50s. As you got into the 60s, the conservator tanks became more and more in vogue. And nowadays, you'll see a mix of both. 
So informational notes on the components, what's usually removed for shipment, what uh, is usually on the unit for shipment. Usually, again, this, this can change based on the shipment, where it's going, the size of the unit, the clearance profile, etc. Here's some notes on the actual materials that come into a factory. Some notes on some additional outbound things that may go besides the transformer. Internal movements in the factory. They often use the flats to move tanks and other items around inside the factories themselves. And then what I did, I went out and tried to capture, I don't claim to have them all, or all kinds of details, but as an overview of the various HO scale transformer models. Starting with the, the one we all probably know about the most, the Walther's prototype, which is a pretty good representation, not a bad kit at all, of a probably though in the 70s and, and later type transformer. Selly, if you heard of them, that giant transformer of theirs, hard to find, but it sure looks like the Alice Chalmers. So I think it's a metal kit, which means a lot of cleanup to do. Probably be a real pain to assemble, but it would assemble into a relatively close match for an Alice Chalmers unit in the 1950s. There's quite a few European types, uh, Euro European prototypes that are out there. This is an NJ International offering a Cabri offering, which looks very, very similar. Here's a large Cabri unit, which I think is a Traffel Union out of Germany design. Very unusual for the United States to have bushings like this. I mean, I'm not saying you never see it, but not very often. Here's an Atlas. I never knew Atlas even made this. Looks very similar to the NJ International and Cabris. But again, I, I could not find, I found this picture somewhere doing a Google search. I don't know if that kit's still out there or not. But it is definitely a European prototype. Artitech has a pretty nice looking, that's a nice looking little load. Now, it is a European prototype, AEG, which is a European manufacturer, but it is based in a little bit earlier era. And it looks good. I mean, you can buy this whole thing. When I last looked from MB Klein for 25 bucks roughly, and it's pre painted, and you may even be able to buy it for a little bit cheaper, unpainted, because I think it's painted. Not bad. It really isn't too bad. Yes, it's European. But if you wanted something to quickly get and have a pretty good looking transformer load, you might want to consider that. Resin Car Works has smaller units, almost look like network transformers to me. Um, just, just the way they look. Uh, they are currently unavailable, but they're not a bad little load as well from Resin Car Works. Item LT1 transformer load, you get two of them. Looking very similar to those, all the old Sunshine Models F.1 transformer load, of another flat resin kit. However, again, good luck trying to find these. As uh, unfortunately, most of us know, Sunshine is long out of business. And, and if you see it on eBay, you're probably going to pay out the nose for it. But who knows? Maybe on eBay you'll find something like that. They're, again, they're good looking, small little units. They sure look to me to be network transformers. Not totally sure. But again, if you can find them, not a bad Transformer load. Proto loads has some custom made. Um, it, they seem to come and go. I'm not totally sure on the availability or how often they are available. They look pretty good. Uh, they call them a GE unit, but to me, they don't, they don't look like GE units. Uh, they would likely be a Rome size transformer, um, but you might want to check their site and see what's available. Shapeways is coming up with some different designs. Now, these designs on Shapeways are fairly basic, but not, not too bad. A little more modern, uh, a little rough around the edges sometimes. Uh, but if you wanted something, painted it up, especially if you put it in the substation in the background, uh, it would probably look pretty good. Uh, obviously, there's no bushings on them or anything like that, but you may be able to, to steal some from one of the Walther's kits. Uh, and again, some of these are a little bit rough. Um, more modern in design, but you can see this one here even has a nitrogen tank. This, I, I assume, is supposed to be a low tap changer. doesn't look quite right to me. It uh, looks like there's three bushing potential devices slung on the side, which would be very somewhat unusual, but you always cut them off. So not bad. And I'm sure over time, more things will likely become available on Shapeways. Also on Shapeways, and I've also seen this at some train shows, is this circuit breaker. Again, it's not a transformer, but
but it is a neat little uh, looking load. Fairly accurate. I'm no expert on oil circuit breakers, but it would be a good representation for a load or in a substation. Almost every substation is going to have some type of large OCB, so it's not a bad little item to have either for you know, an ancillary load or for modeling the substation. So this is, again, brief overview. It was a handout at the session. If you're interested in it, again, here's my email. Shoot me a note. I'll be glad to send it to you. I'm going to try to keep this updated as much as I can as new things come on the market and whatnot. But just a brief overview of some of the available models I've seen and some generic information. Again, high level, somewhat uh, uh, generic, not really specific, but just to give you an overview of the various information out there for, for modeling transformers on your layout. So, all right, so that's it. So hopefully it was somewhat enjoyable. Maybe you learned something. Uh, again, I'm going to start working on you know, other clinics. Um, let me know what you think, any questions, any ideas for things you'd like to see. Uh, be sure to let me in, uh, leave me a note in the comments or drop me an email. Uh, looking forward to it. This is one area I really, really enjoy. So I do want to press this forward because my biggest pet, I'll close with this, my biggest pet peeve, you know, we as modelers are often really, really good at modeling rolling stock, locomotives. We know down to the, the third rivet from the left-hand side and the paint scheme that changed on May 3rd, 1958. We, we know all that stuff. And I've seen some very, very nice depressed flat cars, modeled, weathered, detailed. Again, they know where the brake pipes are, and this goes here, this goes there. And then they slap a European prototype on the 1950s era flat car. I'm like, oh, come on, please. So again, part of what I want to do is to expand the knowledge. So if you do have one of those beautiful flat cars, you can put an equally beautiful and prototypically accurate transformer on that flat car and have a really spectacular model. So thanks for watching. Uh, again, uh, shoot me your comments down below or shoot me an email. And uh, look forward to making some more clinics. Hopefully uh, keep working on that and get them posted in the near future. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.